out my fellow darling Whovians, I hope you're doing okay. This is Sean Ferrick here for Who Culture, and we've got a job that means I need this coffee. It's every classic Doctor Who companion ranked from worst to best. 27. Adric. Listen, if you've watched early Doctor Who, with all love and respect to Matthew Waterhouse, there was no question Adric was going in this slot. He was a boy genius from eSpace, and unfortunately, he absolutely knew it. He was arrogant, he was brash, he was a bit like me when I've had a few too many drinks and someone says, oh, have you watched Doctor Who? And I'm like, haha, sit down, son. Adric was one of the companions who went boom. He was on a ship that exploded, and what's more, the Doctor refused to save him. Take from that what you will. 26. Mel Bush. Now, Mel, God love her, she was introduced out of order, which, a bit like Fox's way of showing Firefly to the world, didn't exactly end well. She was cast primarily because she could scream the rafters off a church, and that was about it. She was a very short time companion of the Seventh Doctor, but more so a companion of the Sixth Doctor, where she badgered him to lose some weight and eat a healthy diet. Yes, because that's what you want to be remembered for. Sorry, Mel. 25. Dodo Chaplet. Now, she was a companion for the First Doctor, and she sort of stumbled into her adventures in the TARDIS because she thought, foolishly, it was a police box. I mean, what would give you that idea? She sort of went along for the ride more than anything else, but she was a bit carefree and a bit silly, really, and she inadvertently caused, you know, a plague, which infected fellow traveler Stephen Taylor. Now, unfortunately, the ending of her story is a little bit of a sad one. She came back to Earth, but then she kind of bounced from halfway house to halfway house before ending up in mental institutions before she was shot and killed. 24. Vizsla Turlo. Now, unfortunately, Vizsla tends to score very lowly on these rankings, and it's pretty much because of how he was introduced to the audiences. This guy had been a double agent for the Black Guardian, who didn't really like the Doctor very much, and had effectively coerced Vizsla into trying to kill the Doctor once he gets on board the TARDIS. Tegan Jovanka saw through him pretty much straight away, but couldn't prove anything but was present for his redemption as well. So good for him and not so good for Tegan. We'll get back for her later on. 23, Chameleon, why? Um, I mean, he could change shape, that was cool. Uh, got taken over by the Master, not so cool. And then got taken over by the Mara, not so cool. Begged to die, the end. 22, Susan Foreman. Now, you might think that Susan might score a little bit higher on this, but it's kind of a funny story behind her story on the show. Carol Ann Ford had been hired with the promise that Susan was going to effectively be an equal to the Doctor in many ways. That she'd be telekinetic, that she'd be telepathic, that she'd actually get to do something. Oh boy, was she lied to. By the time it got to her leaving, she was desperate to go and... I'm sorry to say, this comes across in some of the performances. Her exit is now iconic, but... Susan, for all of her status in Whovian history, really didn't stand out that much. 21. Katerina. Katerina had been a companion of the first Doctor and was in fact the first companion in Doctor Who history to die while travelling with the Time Lord. She was originally from ancient Troy. She had been a handmaiden to Cassandra. Now, when Vicky Pallister and Stephen Taylor and the Doctor arrived in Troy, she was assigned the job of spying on them, particularly Vicky, who they thought was a Greek spy herself. Katerina was swung over to their side. She chose to help them, and then she elected to leave in the TARDIS with them. Now, Vicky stayed behind in Troy. Unfortunately, pretty soon after this, Katerina was held hostage by someone who was trying to get the Doctor to bend to his will. Katerina, showing absolutely no fear, blasted the pair of them out into space, sacrificing herself to save the Doctor. This stayed with the Doctor for a very, very long time and decided a lot of how he acted going forward in the future. 20. Liz Shaw. Now, Liz Shaw is a bit different because she's the first on this list who never actually travelled in the TARDIS. She was a companion of John Pertwee's third Doctor while he was based on Earth, while he was working with UNIT. While she was assigned to help and aid him, 
She also didn't take nonsense very well. She once said to the doctor that the only reason he needed an assistant or companion is that he needed someone to stand beside him and tell him how brilliant he was. Fair play, Liz. 19. Harry Sullivan. Now, when you think back to the fourth doctor, generally you think of a few names. You think of maybe Sarah Jane Smith, you think of Romana. You don't necessarily think of Harry Sullivan straight away. However, Harry was there at the genesis of the Daleks. While he might not have been the most memorable of companions, he was fun. You know, he was able to hold his own and eventually he just kind of left. He did stay in touch with Sarah Jane. Apparently they kept up every year until eventually he was declared missing in action. 18. Victoria Waterfield. She was a companion of the second Doctor and Jamie McCrimmon. Now, kind of because they sort of kidnapped her, which is a little bit of a theme with some of the companions on this list. She's one of the youngest people to have ever travelled in the TARDIS. She was 15 when she joined up with the Doctor and Jamie, and she had also just watched her dad get murdered by the Daleks, so she was a little bit vulnerable. Having said that, she was well able to hold her own against Cybermen, against Abominable Snowmen. She actually grew up an awful lot in the TARDIS. Now, while she was not the strongest of companions, she was by far from the weakest and she elected to leave the Doctor herself, bidding him goodbye on a lonely beach, which is something we might see again. 17. Polly Wright. Now, Polly was a companion of the first and second Doctors. So we're going all the way back now to 1966 because Polly was present for the events of the 10th planet. That's right, she's one of the first humans ever to witness a regeneration of a Time Lord after the battle with the Mondasian Cybermen. She was initially a little bit more open to the idea of the second Doctor and she had to convince Ben Jackson that he was actually the same guy. Eventually she opted for a bit of a quieter life and she left the TARDIS and the travels behind. 16. Ben Jackson. Ben travelled with Polly. He actually met Polly first before he ended up with the Doctor. He accidentally stumbled into the TARDIS. Another kidnap victim. But it was hardly, uh, hardly unwilling. He fairly enjoyed himself fairly quickly, although he did struggle to believe that he was in medieval Cornwall when they went on their first trip. Along with Polly, he witnesses the regeneration of the first Doctor into the second Doctor, and he takes a lot longer to adapt and to understand that the second Doctor is in fact the same man. He stayed with the Doctor long enough to meet Jamie McCrimmon, although he then left the TARDIS after that, but happy ending. It seems like himself and Polly got married somewhere along the way. 15. Perry Brown. Now, Perry travelled with the fifth Doctor for a short time, and she was the one who was actually present at the end of the case of Androzani to see the fifth Doctor regenerate into the sixth Doctor. Now, things would take a rather violent turn very quickly for poor Perry, because she was the one who got to see the opening days of the sixth Doctor as he struggled with his new regeneration, to the point where he wrapped his hands around her throat and tried to throttle her. Now, if you think life got easy for her after that, yeah, not so much. Uh, during the trial of a Time Lord, the Time Lords actually took her away and there were several different outcomes. In one, her mind is entirely destroyed as her body's taken over. In another, she's married to King Yerkanos, which actually that was kind of okay, really. So, depending on which way you look at it, Perry either had a great life or a terrible life, but Either way, it was changed after entering the TARDIS. 14. Nyssa of Traken. Nyssa came from Trakenite nobility, and she actually met the fourth Doctor and Adric after the events of a wedding, a wedding that the Master crashed. The Master orchestrated not only the death of her aunt, but also the death of her father, although she was not a witness to the death of her father. She only found about that one later on. She was present for the events of Logopolis, which saw the fourth Doctor regenerate into the fifth Doctor. In fact, she managed to help the Doctor get back to the TARDIS after he was going through some fairly bad regeneration groovy. She would stay long enough to get infected with a disease that, although she was cured by, she did elect to stay behind and cure other people of this disease. She was a good person and she was a good companion, if not the most memorable. 13. Tegan Jovanka. Tegan is sort of a mixed barrel when it comes to a companion. Certainly she was strong, 
she knew what she was at, but she never seemed to truly enjoy her travels in the TARDIS, at least not for a good while. Initially she stumbled into the TARDIS, which dematerialised away without realising she was in it, after her car broke down with her Aunt Vanessa. Now, as she went, her aunt was murdered by the Master, something that, while it was not the Doctor's fault, she felt herself harbouring a resentment toward all Time Lords for this after a bit. For her early time in the TARDIS, she tended to wear an air stewardess's uniform because she was on the way to Heathrow Airport when she was picked up by the TARDIS. So she stayed in this uniform to remind the Doctor, will you get me there please? She did eventually get there, although it was with the fifth Doctor at that point, and then after a short while she was like, nah, I'm not feeling this. And she met up again with the TARDIS crew and it got a bit good for a while, until resurrection of the Daleks when she went, this is not fun anymore. There was too much death, too much killing, and she booked it out of there. Number 12, Leela. Leela has one of the strongest female companions that has ever traveled with the Doctor. She was primarily traveling with the fourth Doctor, and she was present for one of the stronger, but more controversial serials. The Talons of Wayne Chiang yeah, yeah, it's not aged well, and to be frank, it wasn't particularly sensitive at the time that it was released. It was a mess, but the actual script was good. That's the, that's the problem. Unfortunately, they managed to just completely lose it. Now, Leela is one of the bright points of that story. As Leela was not a human, she was not hampered by some of the human drawbacks that the other companions were. For example, she was present on Gallifrey, when the Doctor was inducted as the Lord President of the Time Lords, where she met Andred. Like many of the other companions across the years, she ended up leaving the TARDIS for love. Herself and Andred became engaged, but the Doctor let K9 stay on with her. K9 who would of course come back in many different versions throughout the years. Oh no, K9's not getting his own entry on this, sorry. 11. Zoe Harriet. Zoe was a super genius from the 21st century and was in many ways an intellectual equal to the second Doctor. One thing that she didn't have, however, was knowledge of emotion. You know, she certainly felt things, but she wasn't sure of how to express them. The Doctor, unfortunately, manipulator that he was, ended up showing her footage of his most recent Dalek encounter to see if she could feel anything. and. She could. He had to promise her that it was okay. He had seen the destruction of the Daleks and that they would never bother them. Yeah. She would go on to face Cybermen and other villains. She was also present with Jamie McCrimmon for the events of the War Games, which saw the three of them on Gallifrey, but unfortunately saw Zoe stripped of her memory by the end of the serial. Unfortunately, she was left in a situation where she didn't remember the Doctor, but she did remember that she had forgotten something very important. 10. Grace Holloway. Grace Holloway was one of the only on-screen companions of Paul McGann's eighth Doctor. She also has the honour of being the person to inadvertently kill Sylvester McCoy's seventh Doctor. Grace was a surgeon and when McCoy's Doctor was brought in, having been shot down in the streets, she went to work, tried to operate on him, but unfamiliar with Time Lord physiology, she accidentally triggered his regeneration. Grace was pretty important. She was there for the events that saw the Eye of Harmony opening in the TARDIS. She helped the Doctor find the atomic clock that would set everything back to rights again. And she was also one of the very first companions to ever have a little bit of a romantic moment with the Doctor. Uh, certainly wouldn't be the last. Unfortunately, that is the only time we've seen Grace because of some licensing issues. She hasn't even returned to the big finished radio dramas. Hopefully she will because further one encounter is pretty good. Nine, Stephen Taylor. He was a companion of the first Doctor, one of the earliest companions in fact. He was also one of the first people to question the reality of the Doctor's actions. He was present during the events of the Daleks' master plan, and he actually questioned whether or not defeating the Daleks was worth the human cost of life that had it transpired for the Doctor's plan. Later, they landed in Paris, and the two eventually had this big disagreement about who was at fault. Stephen left the TARDIS at one point, but the Doctor then refused to check in on their Huguenot friends, 
which led to slightly more death and destruction. Stephen was eventually worn down by the sheer amount of doom that he saw while traveling with the doctor, and he elected to leave the TARDIS. Now he did so to rule a kind of a conglomeration of savages and elders on an Earth-like planet. Doctor agreed that with his level head, he really was the best man for the job, and he promised to drop in with him from time to time. Unfortunately, as is so often the case with the Doctor, that promise has yet to be fulfilled. Eight, Vicky Pallister. Another companion of the first Doctor, she actually met Barbara and Ian, and was sort of a stand-in for Susan, who had just left the TARDIS, at the end of the events of the Dalek invasion of Earth. Now, there was a bit of a, a bit of an unfortunate kerfuffle at the beginning because her pet, Sandy, was shot by Barbara, who thought she was trying to attack Vicky, which made for a very cold first impression. She ended up traveling with the Doctor to ancient Troy, where she ended up taking on the name Cressida and falling in love with Troilus. Now, she elected to then leave the TARDIS and stay in the past, and their love story is in fact one for the ages. Seven, Romana one and Romana two. Romana was a young time lady who traveled with the Doctor as a way to not only develop her own skills, but also kind of get off Gallifrey and see the universe a little bit. Initially, the Doctor, the fourth Doctor I should say, was a little bit well, he acted like the fourth Doctor, which made for a bit of a strained relationship in the beginning. In fact, she ended up regenerating, and there's a couple of different explanations as to why. However, the one explanation that seems to stick the most is that she did it on a whim, just to sort of show him that, you know what, she can do things differently, she can have a bit of fun. She ended up regenerating and taking on the appearance of Princess Astrid of Astra. At this point, she continued to travel with the fourth doctor, but when they went to E space, when they ended up meeting Adric, she elected to remain behind there. Now, the story goes that she did eventually return to N space and rose through the ranks and actually ended up as the lady president of Gallifrey. Six, Joe Grant. Joe was stationed at Unit and ended up helping the third Doctor in several of his adventures. Now, unlike Liz Shaw, Joe did actually travel in the TARDIS. Along the way and after some of their adventures, she ended up seeing the Master get condemned to eternal torment, at which she expressed a kind of a pleasure at this. The Doctor questioned her and said, does anything really deserve eternal torment? torment. This, this left her thinking. Later she would arrive in Lanferfac and she would fall in love with Professor Clifford Jones. Now while she might have been delighted at this, the Doctor was not so happy. This was one of the first examples of the Doctor's jealous streak. He wished them well, he toasted their engagement, gave them a crystal as a wedding present, and the next time she saw the Doctor, it was as the 11th incarnation. Five. Ian Chesterton and Barbara Wright. Well, these were the first two victims, uh, companions of the Doctor, not of course counting Susan Foreman. They were in fact Susan's teachers. They knew that Susan was a different child, and so they elected to follow her to her home address, which turned out to be a junkyard in Totters Lane. They hear her voice coming from inside an old police box and the beginnings of their adventures in the TARDIS. With the Doctor, they would travel back to the era of cavemen, they would travel and meet Marco Polo. Barbara would end up impersonating an Aztec god, which didn't really go so well. They, they saw a lot. They would see Susan depart the TARDIS, and they would also depart the TARDIS not too long after themselves, as Barbara figured out that they could use a Dalek time machine to get home. The pair of them, they really did enjoy traveling with the Doctor, but they really did want to get back and live their lives again. And so they got back to London two years after they left. Now they must have explained something away because Sarah Jane remembered years later that Ian and Barbara were a lovely married couple who never seemed to age. Four, Jamie McCrimmon. Jamie was a companion of the second Doctor and in fact stayed with this incarnation of the Doctor for most of that man's life. He was a Scotsman from the Highlands in the 18th century and he was one of the most fun 
companions ever. He wasn't afraid to call the Doctor out from time to time. He saw a ruthless streak in the Doctor that did need to be challenged. He did, however, agree with the Doctor that they had a duty of care. He was instrumental in the Doctor's choice of bringing Victoria along with them in the TARDIS. He was very close with Zoe Harriet. In fact, there was probably a hint of a romantic relationship as they went into their final adventure together. Now, unfortunately, the Time Lords put pay to that as after the close of the War Games and the forced regeneration of the second Doctor, Jamie and Zoe's memories of their troubles were wiped. Jamie was left with the memory of his first encounter with the Doctor as he was dropped back into a situation in Scotland. However, this situation saw Jamie facing down a group of English red coasts. He had a sword in hand, he was feeling particularly brave, and he charged them down screaming in delight. Number three, Brigadier Alistair Gordon Lethbridge Stewart. One of the longest serving companions, although companion with an asterisk, the Brigadier, or the Colonel as he met the Doctor as, has been the grown up in the room whenever he's been around the Doctor. He first met the second Doctor in the serial The Web of Fear. He would then be instrumental in setting up Unit, so he would spend a lot of time with the third Doctor. He didn't get on as well with the fourth Doctor, who seemed to be a bit resentful toward him when he asked him to come back to Earth to help with something. The fifth Doctor he met in the events of the five Doctors. He skipped over the sixth Doctor, but he did meet up again with the seventh Doctor. Throughout everything, he was was a staunchly trustworthy man. He raised a family and though he was initially estranged from his daughter, Kate Lethbridge Stewart would also grow up to be very important in the Doctor's life. The Brigadier would stay close with Sarah Jane Smith and in fact they would continue to speak for the years leading up until the old man's death. Number two, Dorothy McShane, better known as Ace. Ace was a companion for the seventh Doctor. And although she was a good bit younger than him, she was absolutely able to match him beat for beat. She was young and rebellious, and the Doctor, in one of his more Machiavellian moves, tended to manipulate her quite a bit, but all in the name of the greater good. He forced her to visit the demons of her past, which she didn't exactly thank him about, but she did admittedly learn and grow from it. She was strong enough to happily take on a Dalek with a baseball bat. Now, the baseball bat had been kind of souped up a little bit, but honestly, she probably would have gone after it if it hadn't been. She's notable as being the last full-time companion of the classic Doctor Who era, depending, of course, on whether you count Grace Holloway in that in-between space or not. Now, her story goes that she went on to found a charity called A Charitable Earth, Ace, and she was also present for the funeral of Sarah Jane Smith. And speaking of number one, Sarah Jane Smith. There really is one contender when it comes to the greatest companion of the classic era of Doctor Who. And that, of course, is Sarah Jane Smith, investigative reporter from Croydon. Croydon, not Aberdeen. Seriously, Doctor. She traveled with the third Doctor, the fourth Doctor, and briefly, the 10th Doctor, while also encountering the 11th Doctor. She never gave up the fight, she never gave up the search, and she never abandoned Earth. She raised her own child, who was in fact a clone created by the Bane. His name was Luke. She worked with Mr. Smith. She worked with K-9. But back before any of this, she was also traveling with Stephen Taylor, where they went to the genesis of the Daleks. She met Davros, something he remembered years later. Sarah Jane was never afraid to hold the Doctor to task, but on more than one occasion, the Doctor introduced her as his best friend because out of all of the people who traveled in time and space with the Time Lord, Sarah really was his favorite. And that, finally, is everything for our list today. If you feel anyone was left off <clears throat> canine, Please don't forget to say so and drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe to us. If you got to the end of this video, remember that you can check in with us over on Twitter at WhoCulture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick as well. Guys, have a sit down, have a coffee. That was not the shortest video we've ever done, but remember you are awesome. Keep it wibbly wobbly and we will see you again soon. Thanks guys.